This is Duke University. I'm James Todd with Duke's News Office, and I am here with Professor Philip Cook from Duke Sanford School of Public Policy. And Professor Cook, uh, we all had strong reactions to the shootings in Newtown last month, but I'm wondering as a gun expert, what were some of your responses and reactions to it? Well, I think my first reaction was as a human being. I, my uh, heart sank when I heard about it, and the, the, the more the details came out, uh, the, the more horrific it really did uh, appear to be. You know, it was something like the seventh mass shooting we had had in 2012, uh, but this one w was the worst in, in terms of its ability to grab the national attention and, and to make all of us realize that th th this is an issue that has to be dealt with. And, and what about um, sort of intellectual connections with your research as the details of the case emerge? Did you start to make connections with your research on the topic? I, of course, um, I've been conducting research in this area for almost 40 years, and over the course of uh, that career, I have touched on most issues that have to do with guns and violence, uh, and including serving on a, a national commission that worked on rampage shootings during the 1990s. So um, I have some framework in, in which to view this uh, from the point of view of science rather than uh, simply as um, uh, a citizen and a, and a human. Uh, and of course what stands out is um, the issues that we have been hearing about since then, the, the school safety issue, the mental illness aspect of it, and, and then inescapably the issue of the the guns that were involved and the fact that uh, the shooter had access to such high-powered guns and uh, was able to then use it to, uh, to, to uh, kill so many children so quickly. And are there any findings from your own research that, sort of, that speak directly to, to one of those issues? I, I think that <coughs> It, it, it's so often the, the case with uh, science and scientists that their research ends up leaving them unsure at, about what the truth is and, and uh, insisting that we be cautious at, about reaching any kind of strong conclusions about what's going on. Uh, that is definitely true in the case of, of thinking about gun policy. There's some areas that I, I think that we can talk about with confidence and, and others, uh, probably most policy proposals that we would end up being less sure about. Um, and, uh, and so I wanted to make sure that's on the table uh, as a possibility. As a scientist, I think I have to preserve um, the, the right to waffle uh, and will do so. Um, but I, I think the overwhelming fact about guns, and, and that this really has been established not only by common sense, but also by uh, research, including some of the research I've done, is that they intensify violence, that, that they take a violent encounter uh, and they make it much more deadly than it would be if it involved another type of commonly available weapon, like a, a knife or a club. Uh, at the time of, of the Newtown shootings, a number of people pointed out that there was an attack in China that was on young children in a school there. But the attacker in that case did not have access to a gun, presumably, and used a knife. So he injured a couple of dozen children, uh, but none of them died. And I think that, in a nutshell, is the difference. I got you. And obviously, uh, it's a big issue in Washington right now. So um, uh, Vice President Biden is, uh, is due to give a report next week, but uh, we've got a clip of uh, President Obama uh, setting up this task force to look at gun policy. So let's listen to that clip. You know what? Uh, I am also betting that the majority, the vast majority of responsible law-abiding gun owners would be some of the first to say that we should be able to keep an irresponsible, law-breaking few from buying a weapon of war. I'm willing to bet that they don't think that using a gun 
and using common sense are incompatible ideas. That an unbalanced man shouldn't be able to get his hands on a military-style assault rifle so easily. That in this age of technology, we should be able to check someone's criminal records before he or she can check out at a gun show. That if we work harder to keep guns out of the hands of dangerous people, there would be fewer atrocities like the one in Newtown or any of the lesser known tragedies that visit small towns and big cities all across America every day. That's President Obama last month in his press conference about a response to the Newtown shootings. Professor Cook, uh, what do you think? Reactions? He mentioned background checks. What do you hear in that that sounds promising? In, in that clip, he identified two of the policy proposals that we may well hear from the vice president on Tuesday. Uh, so one would be to reinstitute uh, some version of the ban on assault weapons. Uh, and the other, of course, is to expand background checks uh, so that they are not just limited to transactions with federally licensed dealers, but also include all of the private sales and the casual hand-to-hand -hand transfers that arm actually most of the criminals uh, along the way. So what do we know about that? Um, in terms of the assault weapon ban, we had that from 1994 to 2004, and then it sunsetted. The Congress uh, refused to renew it. Um, there, in fact, is not a great deal of evidence that it was effective uh, during that time in terms of everyday violence and uh, homicide. What is the evidence there? Because obviously this assault weapon ban is so politically charged on both sides of the issue, but you're saying that your research says it, it doesn't have a strong effect. Right, and in that case, it was not my research, but research done by people I respect um, who uh, were faced with the problem that I have encountered on, in other projects that I've done. Uh, and that is that we actually don't expect uh, the ban on the assault weapons to have a large effect on the, say, overall homicide rate or the gun homicide rate. Um, we might expect that it would uh, eventually have a, a reduction of two or three percent, uh, something like that. And a small change like that, uh, while it might be entirely worthwhile from a policy point of view, is very hard to measure from a scientific point of view. Uh, so that's where we're left with that area. The, we did learn something more than, than just that we're unsure, um, and, and that is um, that the structure of that 1994 law, which did not do anything about the assault weapons already in circulation, uh, undercut its effectiveness. Um, and I think that that was particularly evident with the case of large capacity magazines. It banned all the clips or magazines with uh, capacity of more than 10 rounds. Uh, but there were millions and millions in circulation already, and they remained in circulation after the law went into effect. So what policies are effective? So I'd, I, again, the first thing I'd want to be, be clear about is that that ban may be effective enough to pass a cost-benefit test. It's not going to cause dramatic changes uh, in terms of the homicide rate but it may be that it would pass the cost-benefit test if we just could measure the, the effect accurately. Uh, there are some other areas uh, I think that we can be uh, uh, more competent. Uh, certainly, uh, the law enforcement focus on gun carrying, uh, particularly illicit gun carrying, uh, strengthening the role of the courts in terms of discouraging illicit gun carrying and gun misuse. Uh, those have been shown actually to be effective, and that kind of deterrent strategy is something that I think should be on the table. In the past, the Congress has provided uh, the localities with uh, assistance in hiring more police, uh, and that is something that we could reinstitute. It would uh, have a good effect in reducing crime overall, and it could be targeted on guns to very good effect. I, I think we can be confident of that. More speculatively is a, 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 a number of other possibilities. One of my um, uh, favorite uh, possibilities is uh, introducing personalized guns. And I, I think that there's 
to some extent, a technological fix in, in this area, uh, which would simply say that if, if you had a gun that was personalized, it, it would basically be locked unless you had the key, and the key would be electronic, as, as many automobile keys are now. Um, so that if somebody uh, stole the gun from you, or there was an unauthorized transfer of any kind, uh, that the person wouldn't be able to use that weapon or misuse it. So if your teenage son, for example, walked off with the gun, uh, then they would not be able to use it to commit suicide or, or to take it to school with them uh, and use it uh, against their classmates. Um, that's, it, it seems to me, a technology that has arrived in, in terms of what we know about it after uh, years of development. And uh, I, I would hope that there would be a good deal of encouragement for adopting that technology. There's a great many other possibilities in this area. And one thing that I want to emphasize is that gun violence, both uh, assault of violence but also suicide, is a multifaceted problem. And what it lends itself to, I think, is a variety of approaches. You mentioned suicide. We don't <clears throat> hear too much about that. But in your research, it's actually guns kill more people by suicide than by homicide. So what, what are some of the implications of that? Yeah, just, just to give you the statistics for 2010, there were over 19,000 gun suicides in 2010 and uh, 11,000 gun homicides. And so it is a, a big difference. Uh, most, uh, a strong majority of all gun deaths are suicides uh, these days. Uh, and so I, I think that it, it fits well with the concern that we've been hearing about mental health, that mm -hmm. the mental health issue is not just um, about rampage shootings, about mass shootings, but it is also, and in, in a more everyday sense, about the concern about suicide. Um, not that all suicides are mentally ill by any means, but I, I think that that is part of the picture. So we've talked about the politics of it. Your colleague and former student, uh, Kristen Goss, she works on that and we got to speak with her about the politics of uh, gun policy. Let's listen to that clip. So some of the areas of agreement uh, where gun owners and non-gun owners would be you know, in, a, in majority support for certain policies. Um, these would include um, mandatory background checks for all gun sales, not just gun sales um, that, are, that go through federally licensed firearms dealers. Um, laws that would require reporting of um, stolen firearms, um, waiting periods in some, um, in some polls, uh, waiting periods before you have to buy a gun, um, receive, receive majority support even from gun owners, um, strict prohibitions on gun ownership by people with mental illness, um, the, um, the, even banning semi-automatic um, kind of assault weapons. In some polls, you'll find a bare majority of gun owners supporting that, but not gun owners who are members of the NRA. So there's a distinction actually between the, you know, the probably close to 77 million households that have a gun um, but don't belong to the NRA versus the 3.1 to 4 million members, depending on the estimate of the NRA. So. Professor Kristen Goss is the head of Duke's uh, Duke and D.C. program up at the Duke Washington office, and she studies gun policy. Professor Cook, from what she was just saying there, um, what sounds both politically palatable, you know, gun owners and non-gun owners can agree, and could be effective? Well, I, I think that the surprising uh, fact is that there's now a lot of discussion about closing the private sale loophole. Uh, that strikes me as a, a fairly radical move, uh, as such things are considered in Washington <laughs> when it comes to guns, uh, and yet it is being much discussed. I, I suspect that the vice president will suggest it. So right now the situation is, again, that we have um, a, a law in place, the Brady Act of, of 1994, that requires a criminal background check and a background check on mental health issues for sales by federally licensed dealers. It turns out most criminals, most people who go on to use the gun in crime,
do not shop at a, a federally licensed dealer. Mm -hmm. they, they get the guns on the street, they get it uh, from uh, people they associate with or maybe even the household they live in. Uh, and that, that um, those transfers are not regulated by federal law uh, and in many cases are entirely legal. Uh, so to close that enormous gaping barn door of a loophole uh, as I say, seems like a fairly radical move. It is true that California already has that in place. So uh, we, we have an example that seems to be working there. And is there evidence that in California it's, it's helping in the crime prevention or at least uh, less violent crime? Uh, so far there has not been a study uh, the, the, of, of the effect on crime. There has been a study on the effect on trafficking and it, it looks like illicit trafficking is, has been reduced uh, by that requirement. Uh, but, but we are waiting to learn more about the, the crime effect uh, and see uh, what difference it's going to make. Uh, it should be pointed out, and this is not intended as a self-servicing but self-serving but there there is very little money available for gun control research by intention and in talking about the different options um the nra vice president wayne lapierre uh said lapierre said now uh, sort of famously that the only thing that stops a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun so what's the evidence about that of deterrence of law abiding citizen having a gun deterring crime yeah i mean uh, of course, the, the first response would be that uh, with more effective controls, we may be able to make sure that that, that bad guy, so-called, does not get the gun in the first place or is less likely to get the gun. And, and so that, that seems to be like, like it should be part of the conversation, and it is. Uh, you know, I, I think the, the question about whether the, the so-called good guy with the gun is the right strategy um, is something that is worth talking to about in the context of the schools. I mean, my daughter is a school teacher. I'm very concerned about this uh, and about school safety. It's a, it's a conversation that we need to have. Uh, and the proposal to put armed guards in all of the schools uh, is is something that perhaps is worth a discussion. Armed guards are already in many schools, so it's not l like this is an entirely new idea. What really worries me is the idea that we start arming school teachers. Uh, you don't I, like that? I, I don't like that. And what's next, to arm the kids? I mean, um, you know, the fact is that um, as horrific as these mass shootings are and the fact that they do pop up from time to time on campuses, uh, it's still true that there's 100,000 schools in the country and maybe one a year uh, in which there's a mass shooting. So the other almost 100,000 are going to be cases where with the NRA proposal we have more guns in that school and every time you introduce guns into uh, a, a new environment it has risks associated with it. So are the extra risks in those 100,000 schools that are not going to have a mass shooting warranted by the fact that you may be able to uh, interrupt uh, a mass shooter in one of those? Um, and you in, don't think so? It's, in Columbine, so. there was an armed guard, mm -hmm. and uh, that person uh, turned out was completely ineffective. So it's not like this is a panacea, even in that one school where it happens. Mm -hmm. And we, uh, someone posted a question on our Facebook page. This is from Derek. And so he referred to a, a local crime incident where there was a carjacking, a gun involved, and then the victim ultimately died uh, later. And so he, he asks, um, how, will, how will gun laws help control that? Um, you know, I thought we already had laws for crimes. So I, I think the, the point he's making is, don't gun laws only work for law-abiding citizens? If you're going to break the law, you're not going to worry about if you've gone through a background check or not. Yeah, I, I think that that uh, view denies uh, the, the fact that um, often the criminals, in, including uh, the robbers uh, and the carjackers, are teenagers. 
uh, who have a very short time horizon and, and not a lot of patience or skill in overcoming obstacles. And if we made it a little more difficult for them to get their hands on a gun, that might actually matter uh, for them and they'd go on to something else. Uh, I did a study of underground gun markets in the worst parts of Chicago uh, and found that many of the thieves and, and the robbers and, and the prostitutes and so on and in that area uh, said they had a great deal of trouble getting a gun and they would like to have one, but they didn't know how to get one. Did uh, you go undercover for that study? I was working with the ethnographer, Sudhir Venkatesh, who was working for over a year talking to those folks. And so while the gang members and the more organized people were able to get guns, a lot of the disorganized criminals were not. Uh, and that presumably saves a lot of lives uh, along the way. The other thing is that I think that it is true that we have to use law enforcement to deter the use of guns uh, and that we, we need the police to focus on, on illicit caring and to take gun crimes very seriously. And we need the magistrates and the judges to do that as well. This is a serious crime. I think we're at a point now that is much like uh, we were in the 1980s with drunk driving. Um, the MAD and other organizations worked hard to get judges to treat that as a serious crime. I think now we have to make sure that the judges take uh, illegal carrying of guns uh, as a serious crime. And is there evidence that if you make the charge, the punishment more severe, that people are less likely to break that law? Uh, there is. And uh, even uh, evidence that having uh, extra years added to the sentence if a crime involves um, a gun has recently been demonstrated to reduce gun use in robbery hmm. um, and to uh, and, and not then result in a substitution of non-gun robberies but just to reduce the overall number of robberies so uh, there's no question that uh, criminals are not a different species. They are, they are us in a sense, and they're subject to incentives like everybody else. In looking at, at trends and statistics, there's an interesting uh, a rise in handgun homicides up until about the mid '90s, and then it drops off. That's it's around 1990. It's around '94, the assault uh, weapon ban and the Brady Bill. But are those connected? Is is it causal to say that the drop-off that we see is caused by that legislation? Yeah, the, the causal connection goes in the other direction, uh, that the reason why the Sarah and James Brady were finally able to uh, be successful with uh, the Brady Act in 1994, really in 1993, was because we had gone through that crack era of incredible epidemic of youth violence that started in the mid-1980s and peaked in 1993. Uh, so th if we look at the, the crime statistics of what happened after that, what, what we see is all types of crime started down, including auto theft, larceny, burglary, you know, a variety of crimes that had nothing to do with guns, uh, and non-gun assault, non-gun robbery headed down at the same rate as gun right? So I think that what we happened to have was the end of the crack era, uh, but it was the crack era that finally convinced Congress to pass the law. It happened to coincide um, with the end of that era and the turning point in that epidemic, thank God. Uh, and we have seen since then continuing declines in all types of crime. What about best examples of gun policies? And I ask because there's federal policy, but different states have different policies. We talked about California. Different cities have different policies. Just this last year, New York had record low violence. Chicago had very high homicides. Can you kind of compare and contrast where gun policies are working at that local or state level? I, th I think at the local level, uh, it, most states um, have adopted a state preemption policy, which means that the, the cities which you know have the, the most severe problems with gun violence, the cities are not allowed to legislate or, or to adopt different ordinances than the state has. Uh, New York is an exception, but one of the few uh, exceptions in this area. What the cities can do uh, is that they can direct the police 
to focus on guns and to get the guns off the street as best they're able to, to send out the word to the gangs that gun use will not be tolerated. And we've seen that in Boston, we've seen it in New York, uh, and to some extent in Chicago as a strong focus of that and a successful one in some cases. We had a question tweeted in here um, that says, do you have the inside scoop on Biden's plans? So we talked a little bit about that. You, you have testified before Congress before but on the issue. Are there sort of, you know, where do you see uh, the announcement going next week about what would be a politically palatable uh, gun legislation? Uh, you know, I, I read the newspaper and, and watch the news and, and <laughs> same as everybody else and have no inside scoop at all. Uh, uh, but what he is saying uh, is suggestive um, of the idea that he is going to endorse a uh, assault weapons ban and a universal background check. Uh, I have no idea what else. For someone who wants to read up on this, um, either you know get statistics or just get good background, we should say you've, you have a book, uh, Gun Violence, The Real Costs. Um, what are some good sources for just knowing this topic? Yeah, and, and I'm happy to correspond with anybody that would like to ask me that question. I could uh, tailor a response uh, to it. There, there is, a, of course, a, an enormous literature uh, in, in this area these days. Uh, if you're just uh, a wonk and you enjoy working with data, I encourage you to go to the CDC's website called WISCARS, W-I-S-Q-A. RS, uh, where uh, you're given the chance to create your own reports uh, about um, violence uh, and especially gun violence or including gun violence. Uh, if you're looking to read books on the subject, I, I think there's a, a nice public health treatment by David Hemingway at uh, Harvard. Uh, and uh, that is well worth uh, reading. If you're interested in the politics, I would certainly endorse my colleague Kristen Goss, who has a book on the politics of the gun movement. Uh, and uh, I have 27 papers of my own I would be glad to share. <laughs> Good. Well, Professor Philip Cook, thank you for taking time to uh, have this Office Hours conversation. My pleasure. A recording of this Duke Office Hours conversation, along with many other Duke videos, will be available on Duke On Demand. That's ondemand.duke.edu. Produced by Duke University. Online at duke.edu.